According to IRA men who saw him fall, Collins was facing the laneway when he was shot, with an entry wound at the front of his head and an explosive exit wound at the rear, as testified by six witnesses, then it's obvious that he was shot from the laneway. After all these years of silence, Jim Carney, who claims to be the last surviving member of the original IRA party at Bailnabla, has agreed to speak. We were there for three days because it was a meeting of the first southern division officers of the IRA in the hope of leading up the war or ending it. You know, because it was hopeless the way it was going. And Collins happened to come through in the morning with his party, you see? So they decided that they'd lay an ambush for him going back. So we took up positions, we laid a mine. I was one of the men now about that mine. How many others were involved that day on your side? You men in the real fight? Four. Three of us and the men that fell the fatal shot. Only four men. Only four. <clears throat> there was five there now. The, the, the scope was still at the back, but he took no part in. Because he stayed where he was. And you know who shot, fired the fatal shot? I know who fired the fatal shot. I was talking to him and he was sorry. Because of the dumb, dumb bullet, you know. It, it don't penetrate, but it, it kind of explode when it hit anything hard, you know. That's how that gaping wound came in the cap and the head. In the interests of historical fact, an establishing fact for once and for all, will you give us the name of the man who fired the shot? Mm, not for any money. However, off-camera, Jim Carney eventually conceded that I had pinpointed the man who shot Collins. On camera, he did say this. It was fired by my Raymond, not my Pete, nor any other one in the Free State Army. And I have now learned that within a couple of days of Collins's death, the intelligence staff of IRA headquarters got a detailed and personal report from the man who said he pulled the trigger. He was 32-year-old Dennis O'Neill, an ex-British Army marksman from Maryborough, Timoleague, County Cork, who had joined the IRA. Nicknamed Sonny O'Neill, it was he who provided covering fire for his retreating colleagues at Bailnabla. According to this letter, he came to Dublin and gave a graphic description of his shooting of Collins to the IRA's then Chief Intelligence Officer, Commandant General Sean Dowling, at a house in Adelaide Road. The letter was written ten months before her death by Moira Comerford, who was an IRA headquarters courier and driver at that time. Sonny O'Neill's name has also been confirmed to me by a surviving IRA intelligence officer, Eamon de Barra, although he understands Collins was lying on the ground when he was shot and was hit by a ricochet bullet. Sonny O'Neill had seen service in the British Army and he was a crack shot. Well, they were there on the brow of the hill when Tom Hale said, I'll go down and shift that cart, lads. I was laid down for the ambush planned in the morning because the farmers going to the creamery in the morning will curse us if the impediments are there. Tom Hales went down, and he was only just down on the place where the cart was when the motorcyclist who was ahead of the Collins party came around the corner, and uh, Tommy Keller shouted down to Tom Hales to clear out and they opened fire in order to cover his retreat. And the firing went on for some time, and then, according to Tommy Keller, they decided to go and join the main body. But O'Neill said, I'll have one last shot at that fellow, and it was pointing to the place where Michael Collins was laying down, they could see him 
indistinctly in the fading light. He didn't intend to hit him, according to Tom Keller. But the road there, it wasn't Tower Macadam at that time, it was a milestone road. And he fired near where Michael Collins was laying, and the bullet ricocheted off a lump of limestone and got Mick in the back of the head. That's it. God rest. But would a marksman such as Sonny O'Neill risk one final shot at Michael Collins in order to deliberately miss the target? Collins was the commander-in-chief of the opposing forces. His killing was simply an act of war. The purpose of the original ambush plan was to carry out that very task. The ambush was set there for him, and whether it was a bullet by accident or not, the ambush was set, and they intended to kill him. There was no doubt at the time in the minds of the IRA's senior officers about who shot Michael Collins, although for obvious reasons, they remained tight-lipped about Sonny O'Neill's report. That silence, understandable though it was, has until now been the cause of denial and counter-accusation. For example, the man who told Eamon de Barra about Sonny O'Neill's involvement had, a few years earlier, said this in a television interview. The remarkable thing was that you had four British officers gathered in. Well, it was remarkable, and uh, uh, Michael Collins would say to a British officer gathered in. You know, it is very hard to believe that. It is, it is hard to understand that from my point of view. Why should he have four officers gathered in? And I believe one of the four said, we'll get him before we come back. And they got him. They got him. They got him. One of the four shot him, I believe. You because the IRA did not shoot him. Did not definitely shoot him. Well, how, there was a couple of shots fired, but... They well, how do you know that, Tom? Huh? How do you know the IRA did not shoot him? Sure, I was there. But, as we've already heard, this man was later to admit to Sonny O'Neill shooting Collins. However, the evidence to corroborate O'Neill's confession, the entry and exit wounds, will only be accepted fully if, and only if, the embalmed body of Michael Collins is exhumed and forensically examined. We would then find out whether that bullet was fired from 10 yards, 15 yards, or 100 yards. And if it was fired for 100 yards or so, then the IRA shot him. If it was fired from closer, then he was shot by one of his own. Exhumation is the only way to solve the matter of the two bullet wounds. And then we know how Michael Collins was killed at the end of the law. The man is dead, the time has gone past, and uh, uh, he, like all the others, are resting in peace now, please, God. And I, I wouldn't, under any circumstances, believe him. Well, I'm only speaking for myself, but I certainly would, wouldn't approve of it. You see, this business of how he died is quite irrelevant to my way of thinking. If it could solve any problem of identity with regard to things, or if it could solve any medical problem, I would certainly have no objection to it. But I couldn't frankly see what could be gained by it. What could be gained but playing to the dramatic and rekindling old wounds by exhuming the body of a man who was laid to rest in August 22 and should remain undisturbed in that rest. Floral tribute was permitted on Michael Collins's coffin, a single white peace lily. It was from Kitty Kiernan. My very only hall. I was terrified that you'd take all kinds of risks, and how I wished to be near you, 
so that I could put my arms tightly round your neck and that nothing could happen to you. I wouldn't be a bit afraid when I'd be beside you. And if you were killed, I'd be dying with you. And that would be great. And far better than if I were left alone behind. I'd be very much alone if you were gone. Nothing could change that. And all last week and this, I've realized it. And that's what makes it so hard. Michael Collins, soldier, guerrilla fighter, politician, diplomat, economist. Hard and cruel, yet capable of the tenderest love. A man who admired not only the tenacity of comrades, but the bravery of enemies. A man who cast a shadow, but was aware of another. What have I got for Ireland? Something she has wanted these past 700 years. Will anyone be satisfied at the bargain? Will anyone? I tell you this, I signed my death warrant. I thought at the time, how odd, how ridiculous. A bullet may just as well have done the job five years ago. These signatures are the first real step for Ireland. If people will only remember that, the first real step. Sonny O'Neill died in 1950. He was 60 years old. After prison release, John McPeak, the armoured car machine gunner, returned to Glasgow. In 1932, under an assumed name, he moved to London and married a Scottish girl of Irish descent. Liam Lynch, IRA commander-in-chief, was wounded on a mountainside in South Tipperary on April the 10th, 1923. He died that night in hospital. His successor ordered a general ceasefire the following month. Two months after Collins's death, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was defeated. The Irish Treaty was one of the main causes. He never again occupied a ministerial post. Eamon de Valera subsequently formed his own political party, Fianna Foyle, and remained in politics until 1959. He served two terms as President of Ireland and retired in 1973. He died in 1975, aged 92. Harry Boland was captured by Free State troops on July 31, 1922 and, trying to escape, was mortally wounded. Kitty Kiernan died in July 1945, probably from a kidney disorder. Her understanding husband had her buried as close as was possible to the grave of her beloved Michael Collins, the grave still in the shadow of Bail Nablar.